Hello and welcome to Supposedly Fun. My name is Greg and I'm here today to do a Friday Reads video where I wrap up the week in reading and talk about any big book news that happened during the week. I have had a whole wild week of reading. I managed to finish two books this week. I have two others on the go. If you'd like to jump to the Friday Reads portion of the video where I talk about those books, you can do so through the timestamp at the bottom. The only thing I'm really going to talk about in advance is mostly some bookkeeping, a little bit uh, updates on what has been going on this week, and uh, just some posting updates and how that is going to be impacted. So if you skip, that's basically what you will miss. Now, the big book news that happened this week was obviously the shortlist for the Booker Prize. I managed to post a reaction video to that. I will link it down below if you haven't seen it. And the thing is, I have not really been able to pay attention to BookTube like at all since then. Later in the day on Monday, we had a friend have a bit of a health crisis and the rest of the week has been taken up with that. So I apologize. I have been terrible at responding to comments on that video and any other video this week because, you know, people don't just comment on the most recent video. They go back and watch old ones and time means nothing on the internet. So if you left a comment this week in particular, odds are I have not responded to you and I'm sorry. And I, at this point, I don't know if I'm going to be able to you know climb my way back up to that. And because my friend had a health crisis, this is a very dear friend, uh, and I, I won't get into it. It's not my story to share. Just it's been an involved thing all week, and my stress level has kind of skyrocketed. My stress earlier in the year had mostly to do with the election, and that has calmed a lot in recent weeks. It's not gone, but it has been a lot better. And this week, it just kind of like spiked all the way back up. So it, it's been a week. <laughs> and for that reason, my, my reading also kind of suffered. And, you know, the thing is, I, I think I have not managed to do another video since Monday. So this is the first time I'm getting back to BookTube. I did quickly film a, a short <laughs> that I posted uh, right before I started filming this. And because things are still a little bit up in the air, I am not going to be able to post anything in the early part of next week. So my goal right now is that I will film my book haul and have it ready to go on Thursday of next week. But that is probably the next time you will see a video from me. And I will film a Friday Reads early. I'm going to need to film it on Thursday next week. I can't film it on Friday the way I have been lately. Because Joel and I are actually going on a trip. And it's going to be exciting. So... We are friends with the people who own Montana Book Company in Helena, Montana. And one of the owners, Chelsea, invited us to the Pacific Northwest Bookseller Association's Fall Trade Show. So we are actually going to be attending that. It is in Portland. And this is particularly exciting because I have never been to Powell's. And that is something that is on my bookstore bucket list. So this is actually a really exciting trip because I haven't been to a book show since I worked in publishing and went to Book Expo, I was working. So I didn't really get the full Book Expo experience, but I did manage to like attend. And this is obviously not going to be on the scale that Book Expo used to be at, but it's going to be really exciting. We're going to meet some really cool people. There are some authors who are going to be speaking there and doing breakfasts. And I am not going to talk about that right now because let's see how much I'll tell. We'll tell stories afterward about some of the people that we got to see. And I, I'm really excited for that. I'm excited to finally, 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 finally go to Powell's. So the downside is not only is the situation with my friend making it a little difficult to post right now, but then I have to get ready for that. So my plan is I will film a book haul for Thursday of next week. I will film a Friday Reads in advance. If I can, I have an idea for a video that I can post on the Monday after that, which is September 30th. Here's the downside. The downside is I have my list of book prize dates in front of me. October 1st is the date that the National Book Award is announcing the shortlists, and I will still be in Portland. There's a chance... If I wanted to, I could probably film a reaction to the shortlist from the hotel room. And I don't want to commit to that because 
it's just a lot. Yeah, I'd rather kind of have fun at the trade show with Joel because Joel will be going with me and doing with that. So I am not going to be able to film a reaction to the National Book Award shortlist until I get back at the earliest. So it'll be a little late. So just so you know, it will be announced on Tuesday, October 1st. The likelihood is that if I do a reaction to it at all, it will be when I get home. So you won't get it until Thursday of that week. And we'll just have to go from there. But so that is sort of the update about uh, posting because it will be just like a little bit sparse. It was a little sparse this weekend compared to normal. You know, this is kind of the level most people post at. And because I work from home, I can usually manage to do three videos a week. And this week was just one of those circumstances where it was like, you know, there's stuff going on. I need to let myself have the, some leeway to not constantly post and update. So thank you for your patience. And I appreciate that. And uh, yeah, if you want to look out for the shortlist for the National Book Award when it is announced, feel free to do so. I will probably do a video when I get back. But, you know, we'll see. Maybe I'll have a whole lot of other things to talk about when I get back. The other thing to mention this week, other than the Booker Prize shortlist, is that the trailer for the adaptation of Claire Keegan's Small Things Like These was released. So the movie adaptation will star Killian Murphy from Oppenheimer, you probably know him from a lot of things, but his most recent role was Oppenheimer, which won him an Academy Award for Best Actor. Rightly so, I would say. And that feels like very good casting for the protagonist of small things like these, which, if you have not read, is a fantastic book. I absolutely love this book. This is sort of the main impetus behind my recent love of shorter books, because this is tiny. I read this in one afternoon, and you could certainly do that. If you need something for Shorty September, this would be a wonderful book to get in, especially since that film adaptation will be coming. And the trailer looks really good. I will link it down below so you can check it out. It looks so good. I am really looking forward to that. There is also a film adaptation of Foster by Claire Keegan. It's called The Quiet Girl. It is on Hulu. It is subtitled because it is in Irish. And we have had it saved to our watch list and we had just have not gotten around to it. So I need to make that happen as well. But yeah, if you want to get a shorty in, Foster would be great as well. But small things like these for sure. And check out the trailer. I think it looks amazing. And Emily Watson is also in it. And it just looks really good. So that is something that is coming up. So let's move to the actual Friday Reads portion of the video. As I said, I finished two books. Luckily, I finished both of those before the big stress ball of the rest of the week <laughs> came up. The first one that I finished was The Prime of Miss Jean Brody. Let me not drop it. I had just started this when I talked to you in my last Friday Reads video, which will be linked down below as well. I think I had gotten maybe 20 pages in, something like that. And this is a pretty short book. So once I actually sat down and spent some time with it over the weekend, I flew through it. It's 128 pages. And I will say in this edition, the type is a little bit tiny, but I still absolutely flew through it. And one thing that's really interesting is that I had seen the movie several times in the past. The film adaptation was released in 1969, I believe, and it starred Maggie Smith as Miss Jean Brody, who was in her prime. And Maggie Smith won an Academy Award for Best Actress for that. Rightly so, it is a fantastic performance. The movie actually kind of downplays some of Jean Brody's romanticism of fascism. In the movie, she talks about Mussolini a lot, in ways that are seem a little naive about how he has his country in order and things like that. And the book goes a little further. Nazis actually kind of come into it in a way that makes anyone who knows the way history went feel uncomfortable. This is set in the early 1930s. And the movie kind of downplays that and the book gets into it. But so Miss Jean Brody is a sort of eccentric teacher. She does not go along with the approved curriculum for the Marcia Blaine School for Girls. She, every time she gets a group of students, she will select a few girls from that, and they will be known as the Brody set. And she spends a lot of time with them talking about um, how to manage your appearance, about artists and love and the world and things like that, and sort of encourage them. When I first saw the movie, The Prime of Miss Jean Brody, I was under the 
misunderstanding that it was a movie about an inspirational teacher. And that is not the case. It is very much a movie that is interrogating her influence over these young girls and whether or not that is appropriate. It is interrogating the response of these young girls to the influence that she has on them. And it is fascinating. It is an absolutely fascinating book. So, yeah, I really appreciated reading this book. I feel like it deepened my understanding of the story from the movie. And, I, I you know, the, I don't want to do a comparison. I, I love doing book versus movie comparisons. I don't think I will do that. But there is a fascinating adaptation here. There are lines in the book that I remember from the movie. So, in some ways, it stays pretty close, but it departs in other ways. And there are uncomfortable elements of this story. There are intended to be very uncomfortable elements of this story, because you know, one thing that I think the movie does is it casts the, the, the same actresses to play the girls at all ages, so it's very difficult to track how old they are at any moment. So, you know, you meet them when they're supposed to be about 10 or 11, and by the end, they're about 18, 19. So it's sort of difficult to track that they're older at certain points when they begin, like, relationships with adult men. And the book does a much better part delineating that, but it is no less creepy. So that would be a sort of trigger warning if you are interested in this. But I would say this is an absolutely fascinating book. I'm so glad that I finally got around to reading it. I have been wanting to read it ever since I saw the movie for the first time. And by the way, the movie is great. I think it's rentable, but it's not streaming anywhere, I think. I could be wrong about that. But yeah, Maggie Smith is amazing as Gene Brody, and it's really good. So I'm so glad I finally got around to this. And it made me interested to read more Muriel Spark in the future. I know, I think my used bookstore has a copy of the Mandelbaum Gate. And they have one other of her titles. So Joel was out with Teddy, but they just came back. And Teddy came flying into the room. I don't know where he went, but he came in. So uh, I... Do you want to say hello? He's sniffing by the bookcase. Oh, well. <laughs> so up oh, there he is. There's your little glimpse of Teddy. Teddy, say hi. Say hi. Let's see if we can get him. Here's your glimpse of Teddy for the day. He actually had his one-year checkup with the vet in the area because we're coming up on our one-year anniversary of Teddy living with us. And he got a clean bill of health. And he's a chronic good boy. And, yeah, we're just grateful to have him, especially since the one-year anniversary is coming. Did you just burp? <laughs> Let me put him down. And we'll get back to... The Friday Reads. So that was the first book that I finished. Not surprised I managed to get it done that quickly because as soon as the weekend set in, all I really needed to do was sit down and I was enthralled. So looking forward to reading more Muriel Spark and it's just a delight. The next book that I finished was Nicked by M.T. Anderson. I had actually been doing this on audio even though I got the book from the library. So now that I have finished the book and I can hold it up to you, I'm going to return it to the library. And this was fun. I didn't love it, but I really liked it a lot, and it was a really good distraction. So the premise of this one is that you have Nicephorus, who is a monk in the town of Bari in Italy, which I mentioned last week, and I'll say it again, is the town in Italy that my mother's family is from. So I love a book with a map, and this has a map in the beginning. So there is the town of Bari just at the tip of the heel of the boot. That's where my, mo my mother's family's from, and that's where the, all of the action begins. So, the protagonists journey on a heist, essentially, from Barry to Myra, over here. And they are intending to steal the body of St. Nicholas. Yes, the St. Nicholas that we know is associated with Christmas, but which people at the time that this takes place mostly knew as the patron saint of travelers. And the book kind of gets into the mythology of St. Nicholas, but basically in the back in the day when this took place, if you were traveling the Mediterranean Sea, you probably spent a lot of time praying to St. Nicholas. And Barry is experiencing a pox. A lot of people are ill and dying. And Nicephorus has a dream about St. Nicholas. And he tells his boss, uh, is that an archbishop? I think it's an archbishop. And the boss essentially interprets Nicephorus's dream as 
St. Nicholas sending a message that he is unhappy with his resting place, so they need to steal St. Nicholas's body and bring it to Barry. St. Nicholas's body, as was rumored of holy relics back in the day, uh, was believed to have healing properties. Specifically, his bones were believed to ooze this sort of bileless fluid that had healing properties, which was particularly appealing to people in Bowery where there was a pox. And you can see on the cover of the book, there's a bit of an ooze coming out of the skull on this cover. So Nicephorus, who is sort of chronically honest and a good man and has a, a measure of actual faith, is sent along on this mission with a relic hunter named Tune, who has stolen other holy relics for other cities. Um, to sort of verify that what they ultimately get are the actual remains of St. Nicholas. And Tune is sort of Nicephorus's opposite. He is chronically learning how to use other people to his advantage. He is very dishonest, but they form a sort of unlikely friendship. And the details of that relationship are really interesting. I would say it's almost a good idea to avoid looking at some of the tags that come with this book on Storygraph because it almost feels like a spoiler. So I would avoid those <laughs> if you want to really go in and appreciate this book for where it ultimately goes. Um, this was a lot of fun. The dynamic between Nicephorus and Tune is fun. It's a bit of a fable, and I admit for part of it I was a little confused because in Tune's uh, group on the boat that he has. He has someone who is referred to as a dog man. And I kept trying to figure out throughout the book, like, is this an actual dog man? Or is that supposed to be, like, is that something I'm just not familiar with historically? And then at the end, there's a brief interview with M.T. Anderson where he talks about how he wanted to keep elements of fantasy. So I guess it is like a literal dog man. But it also plays with notions of religion and faith and in really interesting ways and what is truth and what is not and what do you how faith can be built on things that are not true actually and really interesting ways of playing with that and actually the more i think about it the more i appreciate it i liked it i had a lot of fun getting through the audio but i didn't think i loved it i said it at the beginning i didn't love this but actually it's a really interesting book to talk about and in talking about the places it goes and the sort of intellectual heft that comes with this journey and what it means probably is going to actually stick with me for a long time so i really had a good time with nicked by mt anderson although i will be returning it to my library i did listen to it on audio and the audio is fantastic the narrator does a really good job nav nav navigating all of the different characters and their voices and things like that so that takes us up to monday i finished nicked on audio on monday i finished the prime of miss jean brody i think on sunday and that's when everything sort of hit the fan. <laughs> and I had already had an idea what my next audio would be. I didn't mention it. I th did I mention it? I don't think so. So my next audio was Part of Your World by Abby Jimenez. And I, I had sort of planned that it would be next. And the reason I was interested in this is that earlier this year, I read Just for the Summer by Abby Jimenez on audio and loved it. It's one of my favorite books of the year. And when I read this book, I talked about how there's a bit of genre snobbery about romance, and I run into it a fair amount. I had gotten comments toward the middle of the year that I read too many romance books, and I should be reading like other more, you know, intellectual or serious books. And what the conversation I had with Just for the Summer is, if that's what you think of romance books, you're actually missing out because Just for the Summer taught me a lot about myself and helped me navigate some of my own like emotional trauma from childhood, but also helped me understand my relationship with my foster son better. I got that from this book. And hot dang, part of your world is doing it all over again. So what I didn't really know when I read Just for the Summer is that it's the third in a series. I don't know if it'll be a trilogy. I believe Abby Jimenez's next book that is scheduled to come out next year leaves this universe, but I didn't know that this was a part three and that they are sort of interconnected books. So the characters of Part of Your World come into play in Just for the Summer, and someone who's a best friend character in Part of Your World comes up in the second book, which is called Yours Truly, and then comes up again in Just for the Summer. However, I don't think you need to read these books in order because the same sense of continuity that you get 
if you read them in order. It works if you read just for the summer first. And I actually really liked something that plays out as a plot twist in Just for the Summer. But if you've read part of your world first, you would kind of know that it's coming. And I would almost encourage you read Just for the Summer first so you get that same plot twist. And then you can go back and find out more about that twist. And I'll say no more than that because you should have that twist yourself. But really great book. And in part of your world, you have a doctor named Alexis who is driving about two hours outside of Minneapolis where she lives and her car breaks down. She gets sort of stuck in mud and she's waiting for a tow truck and a man named Daniel stops and helps her out. And because it's late at night and there's fog, she stops at the VFW in this small town two hours away from Minneapolis and ends up having a conversation with Daniel. And they flirt, they have a one night stand and she leaves and she can't stop thinking about him and he can't stop thinking about her. So they end up having more conversations and their relationship deepens and grows from there. And it's really interesting. But Alexis has this very complicated family. Her parents have been prominent figures in Minneapolis and specifically with the same hospital that the character Emma gets a temporary job at in Just for the Summer. So, again, you're sort of in the same world with a lot of the same characters. And... Yeah, so she is sort of navigating this complicated relationship with her parents and the expectations that they have for her. And she just got out of this emotionally abusive relationship with a man who factors into Just for the Summer in a supporting role, but in a very key way. And it's interesting to see how that develops over time. So basically, this book is, has been like unexpected therapy for me all over again, because a lot of the things that Alexis is dealing with with her family are things that I have dealt with with my family. And that is really interesting. And of course, it's different, but it feels very therapeutic. And it's like Abby Jimenez doesn't actually know me like we've never met, but it almost feels like, does she know me? Because I've gotten a therapeutic experience out of just for the summer. And I've, I feel like I'm having therapy all over again with part of your world. And that's wild. It's wild. And, and it, again, it bears repeating. Anybody who really thinks that there's no value in reading genre books or romance books is missing out because I'm having another profound experience and like emotional revelation after emotional revelation by going along on this journey in part of your world. And now I can't wait to read yours truly and then visit some of the other books that Abby Jimenez has written that are sort of outside of this series. And there's, it's just so cleverly done. You know, I don't think she knew all of the directions and how all of the puzzle pieces were going to fit together, but they fit together so seamlessly. And again, I feel like having read the third book, going back to the first, everything still fits really well, at least so far. I'm only about halfway, a little more than halfway through part of your world at this point. And just loving it. Just absolutely loving it. So uh, we'll see. I should be done soon because now that I'm I, I am into it, this book has been therapeutic, not just because it feels like it's drawing stuff up from me, <laughs> but uh, it has been a perfect and necessary distraction. And now that we're a little later in the week and hopefully things are calming down a little bit, I am hoping to be finished with it. I, I'm able to focus on it a little more. Like I tore through a good chunk of this book yesterday as I'm filming this. I was at, I think, 8% at the beginning of the day, and I was at 41% by the end of the day. So I flew through a huge chunk of the audio, and I can't wait to get further. Now, I was still thinking of shorties at the beginning of the week when I finished Prime of Miss Jean Brody. I had a lot of difficulty choosing a book and focusing on a print book. I was much better able to listen to something on audio this week just because of you know, stress and everything. So I really struggled with choosing what my next print book would be. Nothing seemed like something that I was interested in. So that pile of books that I showed you last week that I was choosing from, all of the different shorties, I made it bigger because I was having such a difficult time choosing from it and finding a book that I was really speaking to me in the moment. And finally, on Wednesday night or Thursday morning, I don't remember which, I looked at the pile again 
and nothing was speaking to me. And I looked at my shelves and I saw Olivia by Dorothy Shrashi. And I thought, ooh, this might be a good time for that. You know, you know, like lesbian intrigue written in 1949. Yeah, I'm in for that right now. So this grabbed me and I started it actually yesterday. And I didn't get too far. I am 18 pages in and this is a very short book as well. I think it's not even 100 pages. It is yeah, it's 100 pages exactly. And this book was written under a pseudonym in 1949, but it was inspired by things that actually happened to the author in her teens. And I feel like I'm going to need to look that up when I'm done. I did not actually read the introduction to the book because I wanted to go in and read it and then I'll go back and understand a little bit more about the story and where it came from. But you have the main character, Olivia, who had been at a boarding school in England and as she is 16, she is now sent to a boarding school outside of Paris in France. Obviously in France, not Paris, Texas. <laughs> and while there, she becomes enamored of one of the teachers at this school. And this obsession is defines the rest of the book. And it's really interesting so far. There's been a lot of setup for the character. And now she is just as I, at the point that I am at meeting the teacher that she will become obsessed with. And it's beautifully written and a lot of psychological insight. Like if you are into Jane Eyre, I feel like this would be a good fit for you. But I'm only 18 pages in. So we'll see how that goes. But I'm really looking forward to finishing this. I'm glad I'm finally reading it. I did get uh, two books from the library. I returned one of them. Because as soon as the stress set in, I was like, I know this is not going to happen right now. Shorties feel like where I'm at in, in terms of stress and what I would able to be, be able to focus on. I might do a short story collection soon. But I will talk about the other library book because I do want to at least make an effort to read this. It's Headshot by Rita Bullwinkle. I finally got it from the library. And it didn't make it onto the shortlist. <laughs> this feels like a heavy cilantro book from the shortlist. People have loved it. People have hated it. Actually, there hasn't been a whole lot of love. The New York Times book review is all in on this book. I fully expect it to be one of their best books of the year when that list comes around. So that'll be interesting to follow. But yeah, it actually is smaller than I had expected it to be. I don't think it's a shorty, but it is shorter than I had anticipated. It is around 200 pages. So it's a little too long to be a shorty, but not much longer. So uh, we will see how that goes. And that'll probably be my next physical book once I get through Olivia. In terms of audio, I don't know what I will be doing next, but I am going to be loving a <laughs> part of your world. And I can't wait for Joel to read it as well. So that is what I've been doing. You won't see me again until Thursday, most likely. And then I will try to film a Friday Reads in advance next week, and then I'll try to have a video for the following Monday, and then we'll just go from there. But I'm really excited about Pacific Northwest Bookseller Association's trade show and catching up on that. I'm excited about Powell's and all of the fun bookish things that will be happening next weekend. So stay tuned for all of that. And I'd love to hear what you've been reading and watching and loving this week. Let me know all of that in the comment section down below. As always, I really appreciate your time, and I will be back until next time. Happy reading.